to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Go before the Lord in prayer and let's invite the Holy Spirit to come and be our teacher. If you have the ability, will you please stand to your feet? I'm going to get down on my knees and let's pray together. Father, tonight we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, we thank you that you've opened up a new and living way for us by your blood. That we can approach the throne of grace and find mercy to help and grace in a time of need. And so tonight we ask you for that grace, God. We ask that the words that we hear would be anointed of God and impart grace to the hearer. That each and every one of us would be built on the foundation of Jesus Christ, rooted in you, built up and established in your ways, Father God. We pray that as we open up your word, that you open it up to us. Give us eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts that understand. And may we be the good ground where the word is sown, that it may produce something in each and every one of our lives. And Lord, we don't just ask this blessing on ourselves. Also, we would ask it on all the churches that are preaching and teaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. They're our brothers and sisters, Lord. We love them. And at no time do we think of ourselves as better than them, but as co-laborers, workers together in your field, building your kingdom. God, we praise you and thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody in agreement said, amen. Amen. All right, you may have a seat. Tonight, this is the blood part number four, and we're talking about what it means to be blood bound. So far, we've seen that we are blood bought. You remember, if you go back to part number one, we learned that Jesus Christ, by his blood, purchased our redemption. He bought us out of slavery. We were enslaved to sin. We, we were in the family of the devil, and the devil had sold us to sin. We were in bondage. We were trapped, and we couldn't get out. And so Jesus Christ, with the purchase of his blood, paid the ultimate price for you and I to free us from that bondage of sin. And now we don't have to live to that old slave master anymore. No, now we are free to live in Christ Jesus. Then we talked about what it means to be blood-bathed, that we are washed in the blood of the Lamb, that Jesus Christ's blood is no ordinary blood. And when you take your life, your robe, your filthy, dirty robe, and you wash it in the blood of the Lamb, when you bring it out, it's not blood-stained. No, now it's washed white and it's washed clean, that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us. It purges all that sin out of us. It takes it and it throws it far from us, as far as the east is from the west. And now we can stand before God clean in his sight. Finally, we found out that uh, last week that we are blood brought, that because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, that it didn't just leave us in sin, didn't just leave us where we were, didn't just clean us up, but now it has brought us into the presence of Almighty God, that we've been given access to God by the blood of the Lamb. And now we can come into the presence of God and we can find what we need from God. That God is now our new provision, if you remember from last week. Jesus Christ himself is the bread from heaven that we need to feed on each and every day. We found out that it's brought us to Jesus in that he is our new leadership. When you need direction, when you need guidance, you need to find out what what to do in your life, that now Jesus Christ is your new leadership. He's the captain of our salvation. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the one that has gone before, and he's opened up the way for us. And now he's looking back to us saying, come on, guys, you can do it. Come this way. I've already blazed the trail, and now you just follow on that straight and narrow path, and you're going to make it. Finally, we learned last week that Jesus Christ is our new law, that as we are being guided in the way that now it is no longer rules and regulations, it's no longer that old covenant, now there is a new covenant, and this is the new law that we've been brought to, and his law is love. Love God, love people. It can be summed up in those words, that we are now to love God wholeheartedly, all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and now we are to love people as we are to love ourselves. And so we know that now we come to Jesus Christ. We've been blood brought to Jesus. He is our new provision, our new leadership, and our new law. Tonight, I want to talk about what it means to be blood bound. Go with me to the book of Hebrews. You know where Hebrews is. In the book of Hebrews, we're going to be in the 13th chapter to start us out tonight. Hebrews chapter number 13. Hebrews chapter number 13, we're going to take a look at verse number 20. Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 20. It says these words. It says, now... May the God of peace, 
who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Now, I I normally don't do this. Normally, I, I wouldn't stop right in the middle of a sentence. But we have to stop there and we have to take a look at what that just said. Now, may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, we understand that, that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. That great shepherd of the sheep, this is our God. He's our leader. He's the one who provides for us. He leads us beside the still waters. He takes us to green pastures. He's the great shepherd. We are the sheep. And then it says through. In other words, there is an avenue. There is a way. Through the blood of the everlasting covenant. And then he goes on to say, make you perfect, make you complete in every good work to do his will, to do those things that are pleasing in his sight. But I want to focus in on these words, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Now, if you don't know what a covenant is, let me describe it to you like this. It is an agreement. A covenant is like a contract. In our day and age, we would say that there are covenants that are like legal documents. When you buy a house, you go and they just lay down that brick O documents, right? And there it is. Here, you got to sign here, sign here, sign here, initial here, initial here, initial there. Everywhere that I've highlighted, you need to sign. And you look at there, and it looks like a checkerboard that you need to sign right in front of you that they've highlighted. And, and, and you're, you're sitting there, and you're signing, 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 until your hand gets a cramp, and, and you're about to fall asleep. That's a legal document. That is a covenant. You are agreeing. There's two parties coming together in an agreement. Uh, another one would be if you're purchasing a car and they break out that mile-long document in triplicate, right? And they're saying press hard because you got to get through all three copies. And, and I want to make sure you initial here, initial here, sign here, sign here, and do all that, right? And now you're agreeing to a certain price to pay for that car in order to drive that car. And if you don't pay that price, then they're going to revoke the covenant and they're going to come get that car from you. Now, that's an okay example. The best example that I can think of for our day and age of what a covenant would be would be the covenant of marriage. Think about it for a second. In a marriage, you've got two individuals. These two individuals find each other, and they fall in love. These two individuals love each other so much that they want to share their life together now. And so they decide that they are going to come together in an agreement, in a covenant, And so they stand before God, they stand before witnesses, they stand before a representative of God on the earth, a pastor, right? And they say vows, I will do these things, I will love you, I will cherish you, I will honor you, I will take care of you, I will provide for you. And they exchange gifts, they give each other a ring, it was carefully selected. It's a precious thing, it's in the form of a circle representing the everlasting love of God, for you and I, and now that what they're doing by giving that to each other is they're saying, now, just like God's love for me, and just like I'm one with God, now I'm becoming one with you, and my love is an unconditional, everlasting love for you. They place it on the ring finger. Some people believe that there is a vein that runs from the ring finger all the way to the heart, and that that's where the center of the person is, that this represents that this is all of me for all of you. Now whatever is mine is yours, and whatever is yours is mine. They eat a covenant meal together and have a celebration, right? And, and, and they remember it every year. They celebrate their anniversary. See, this is one thing that we look at in the Bible as covenant. This is probably the best example that we can see. Now in the New Living Translation, if you read Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20, in the New Living Translation, it says that he ratified an eternal covenant with his blood. Ratified means to confirm. Ratified means to approve. So Jesus Christ confirmed or approved the everlasting covenant. Now think about it for a second. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. That means that before Adam and Eve ever were on the planet, before God had spoken the worlds into existence, that Jesus Christ had already shed his blood. You say, well, how does that work? I don't understand that. Because if you get a timeline and you start here and you go this direction, here's creation, here's Adam and Eve, here's the fall, here we come up and we see Moses, and you come up here and you see Moses, right? I'm sorry, Abraham, and then you see Moses down here with the law, and then you keep coming, then David, right, and the kingdom is set up, and then you see the exile, and then you come over here in the return, and they build the temple, and they build the walls, and then... Here comes Jesus Christ. So all the way over there 
was the foundation of the world, but Jesus Christ is slain here, but you're telling me that all the way over here, before the foundation of the world, that Jesus Christ was slain. But see, God doesn't live in our timeline. God is not bound by our time. God is outside of that realm. God is above that realm. Otherwise, he would be bound by those things, and that would be a greater force than God. God is the one who declares the end from the beginning. It was a purpose and an intent in God's heart, and God had made an agreement in heaven. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit already knew what they were going to do and had already agreed and covenanted upon what their intent was to do. That looking forward, God was declaring the end from the beginning, and he was saying, I'm going to create the heavens and the earth. Is everybody following me? I'm going to create the heavens and the earth. I'm going to place man on the earth. I'm going to give him a boundary of all the trees you can eat, but thou shalt not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and of evil. Now, God knew how he had created man and placed this man in this garden. He knew the boundaries. He knew the allure. He even knew that the devil was loosed on the earth because he had cast him out of heaven already when he tried to exalt himself. And therefore, God, in his foreknowledge, said, man has the free will choice to either accept the terms or to reject them. But he can't change them. And so therefore, when man entered into this agreement with God and heard the word of the Lord saying, you, sh you shall not eat, of this tree. When God broke that agreement, when God broke that law, now he was bound by the consequences of that law, which we know was the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. So God had a provision already in mind before the foundation of the world. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit speaking to one another as three persons, yet as one God. Very hard for us to grasp, but think about it for a second. You're a person... You are a spirit who has a soul, a mind, a will, and emotions that lives in a body. You are a three-part being. And don't tell me you've never talked to yourself. <laughs> it's actually quite healthy to talk to yourself. So here's God with an understanding of what he's going to do. He declares the end from the beginning, the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. I already know what they're going to do. And therefore, Jesus Christ is going to have to go to the cross. He's going to have to suffer. He's going to have to shed his blood and die because of what happened over there. Can we have the verse up for one moment, please? Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 20. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, or in the New Living Translation, it says that he ratified an eternal covenant with his blood. In other words, the covenant was already agreed upon in heaven, and Jesus Christ confirmed it by shedding his blood. Everybody understand that? Jesus Christ came and approved it and confirmed it. He ratified it with his blood. What does that mean to you and I? Well, it means that God already knows his purposes. God already knows his intent. God already knows what he wants to do in our life. And just like Jesus... Now we have a free will choice. Now we can live for his purposes or we can live for our purposes. Now we can do things his way or we can do things our way. We can either accept God's plan, we can reject it, but we can't change it. Why? Because it's an eternal covenant agreed upon by the Father. Now we get a picture of this covenant, this whole idea of the blood of an eternal covenant, we get a picture of this in the Old Testament. Turn with me to the book of Genesis. Let's take a look at this tonight. Book of Genesis chapter number 15. Genesis chapter number 15, we, got, we, we encounter a guy by the name of Abram. You know him better as Abraham. God changed his name after a little while. But in this part of the Bible, he's still named Abram. God is speaking to Abram, starts to talk to him about what he's going to do. Abram starts talking back to God and saying, no, wait a second, you're going to give me all these things, you're going to do all this for me, but I don't have any children yet, God. 
And so in Genesis chapter number 15, we pick up the story in verse number 7. God is speaking to Abram, and it says in Genesis 15, 7, Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. Everybody say inherit. Okay, let's try that again. Everybody say inherit. Okay, that's a little better. We're going to come back to that concept. Verse number 9, so he said to him, and he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? In other words, God, anything that you give me is going to pass on to someone that's not in my bloodline. I have no children, God. I, 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 I don't understand this, God. What's going on? You're making these promises to me, and anything you give me isn't going to stay in my, in my line. That's not an inheritance. See, in their day, their inheritance, their heritage was through children. That's how they could keep the name going. That's how they could keep whatever they were doing going. We don't have that idea in our, in our understanding. See, we're laying up for our retirements rather than laying up for our children. It's almost a, a different concept than what they had in this day and age. And so here's Abram talking to God, and he says, God, you're going to give me this land to inherit it. How shall I know, God? You're talking to me about kids. You're talking to me about inheritance. You're talking to me about generational things and things that are going to take place long after I'm gone, and, and, and I'm an old man, God, so, so how will I know? Now look at God's response in verse number 9. So he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a cow, three-year-old female goat, three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Now, I would have been scratching my head and looking at God and saying, what are you talking about, God? But Abram doesn't scratch his head and ask God, what is this all about? Look at Abram's response. Verse number 10. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. Can I ask you a question? Why did he just cut all of those things in half? Why did he not cut the birds in half? God didn't tell him to do any of that stuff. And yet, Abram, when he heard that response, knew exactly what God was talking about. Could it be that at the beginning, when Adam and Eve fell, and God looked at them with their fig leaves on, we talked about this, and God brought out the animal, whatever it may be. I believe it was probably a sheep, probably a lamb without spot or blemish. And he sacrificed that animal, that innocent life, for the guilty parties. And the Bible says he clothed them with tunics of skin. You remember that in Genesis chapter number 3. He clothed them with tunics of skins. He made coverings for them out of skin. He had to sacrifice an animal, shed the blood, and therefore he was able to clothe them with tunics of skin. Then you skip forward, you see Cain and Abel are bringing a sacrifice. How did they know to bring a sacrifice? Unless mom and dad had told them, this is the way that you approach God is with blood. Why? Because there's an innocent life given for a guilty one. This is what's acceptable to God. Now, you remember Cain, his, he brought the, the, the fruit of, of the ground. Abel brought from the field, right? Abel's offering was accepted. Cain's was rejected. Why? Because Cain's was his own efforts. Abel's was the way God had asked him to approach him. And therefore, Cain got mad. God says, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? So it's passed on from generation to generation, from generation to generation. And now when God starts talking to Abram, saying, I'm going to give you this land to inherit. You're going to possess it. I brought you out of your old land, now into this land. You followed me this far, Abram, and now you want to know how you're, you're going to be sure that you're going to inherit it? Well, this is how you're going to be sure. Bring me these sacrifices because we are going to cut covenant together. Now we're going to come into an agreement, Abraham, and you're going to find out some things about me because I'm going to reveal myself to you. I'm going to become a covenant partner and I'm going to open up some things to you, Abram. I'm going to make an agreement with you. And therefore, Abram got excited, ran off and grabbed all everything that God had told him to get. And he brought him back to the place where he met up with God and he cut 
those animals in half because he had seen it and it was passed on from generation to generation. In fact, if you look in, in, in the tribal lands, if you look in the ancient lands, when they were making a covenant, they would cut those animals in half and they would separate them, put one side over here, put one side over there, and then they would stand in the middle. And, and as they were standing in the middle of those pieces, they would be facing back to back. Now, real quick, Pastor Luke, can you come up here for a second? I'm going to use Pastor Luke for a moment. He was looking too comfortable over there. Now, let's say Pastor Luke and I were going to come into an agreement. We were, going to, we were going to cut covenant together. And so Pastor Luke and I, we decided, okay, we're, we're coming to an agreement. We would say what the terms were, what we were agreeing upon. Let's say he had a field, and I wanted to buy that field from him. Okay, and so we had a purchase price, we had agreed upon it, and, and, and beyond that, we said, well, now we're going to be neighbors because the field is right next door to your house, and therefore, I want to come into a covenant with you. And so what we would do is we would say, okay, we're coming, now we're going to be covenant partners. I'm going to buy the field, it's going to be a part of that, but not only that, now, because I'm living next door, I want to make sure that he and I are like one. And so what we would do is we would cut an animal right down the center, and we would place one side over here and one side over there, and we would stand back to back. Come on, let's stand back to back real quick. And then what we would do there in that is we would recite the terms of the covenant. I get the piece of property. You get the money. Okay, and now we're going to be covenant partners. Everything that I have is yours. Everything that you have is mine. If my enemy's coming against me, you're coming to help me. If your enemy comes against you, I'm coming to help you. Uh, that's, that's just how it is. Okay? And then we would point at those pieces and we would say, if I don't keep the terms of this covenant, may it be done to me as it was done to this bloody animal. That's pretty serious. And then we would walk, go ahead and walk, and we would do a figure eight and we would come around, okay? And then we would come back into the middle of those pieces and we would face each other, thus sealing the covenant. Thank you, Pastor Luke. Give him a hand. So here's Abram. He's just cut all these animals down the, the center. He's arranged them in order. He didn't cut the birds. And I say, why didn't he cut the birds? Well, you find out that in the book of Leviticus when it starts talking about the sacrificial offerings. They didn't cut the birds in half. They, they, they just wrung their necks, basically, and poured the blood out. That was an a, a offering that could be brought for people who couldn't afford to bring the lamb. In some instances, it was a free will offering. We don't have time to get into it. But all of these sacrifices that Abram was ordered to bring, all of them are fulfilled in Jesus Christ our Lord. Basically, what God was doing was he was foreshadowing what was going to take place in Jesus Christ because there was free will offerings, there was sin offerings, there was peace offerings, there was burnt offerings. Jesus Christ now is the one who allows us to have the will of God in our lives. Jesus Christ is our peace. Jesus Christ was the sacrificial lamb slain for our sins. Jesus Christ was the burnt offering completely consumed in the wrath of God for the will of God and completely broken and poured out for you and I. All of those offerings are now brought together in Jesus Christ. So Abram's getting excited. He knows that now God is going to be the covenant partner. But let's take a look at what takes place. He brought all these to him, cut them in two down the middle, placed each piece opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. Verse 11, and when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Verse 12, now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Now, Abram was thinking, I'm going to go back to back with God, and we're going to walk through these pieces. And so when the vultures came down, he said, no, 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 get away from this. No, you can't, you can't mess this up for me. Not going to let anything get in my way. But then as the sun is going down, great darkness and horror fell upon him, and he starts to fall asleep. He, he, he starts to get a little drowsy. Eyes are dropping down. Verse 13, then he, speaking of God, said to Abram, no, certainly, no, certainly. You asked me, Abram, how will I know? No, certainly, that your descendants will be stranger in a, in a land that is not theirs and will serve them and they will afflict them 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. Now, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Now, we don't have time to get into all of that, but just notice that God starts talking about Abram's descendants. You can't have descendants without having kids. So God is saying, no, certainly, because 
we're cutting covenant here that there is an agreement about what's going to take place in your life. I have sworn, I have declared it, and I will not relent. This is going to take place. This is a purpose of God. Now take a look at what happens. Verse 17, and it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark, that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. Two entities passed through the pieces. A smoking oven and a burning torch. The Bible says that our God is a consuming fire. When God descended on Mount Sinai, it looked like that burning oven. Looked like that smoking oven. Great cloud of smoke lit up the mountain. When God's presence entered the temple, a thick cloud of smoke entered the temple. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit came upon them as burning tongues of fire in the book of Acts. See, there, there was two parties present, God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, and the Son was symbolized in the sacrifice and in the blood. God had made an agreement that now Abraham was going to be the benefactor of. We see this with David and Jonathan when they made a covenant later on in the Bible. Here's David and Jonathan where they loved each other as their own soul, right? Now here's, here's Jonathan just bestowing all his stuff on David, giving him everything he had, giving him his belt, man, giving him his weapons, and, 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 and makes a covenant with him, right? Cuts a covenant with him. Later on, after Jonathan is dead, David starts talking to his servants and saying, hey, is there anybody from Saul's family that I could show kindness to for the sake of of Jonathan. What happens? Here's Mephibosheth, right? He, he, they, they, they heard that, that Saul and Jonathan were dead, so they scooped him up and they ran off with him, and they had dropped him when they were in there running away in haste, and it hurt his foot, so he's lame in his feet. And they said, well, actually, there is one. So David sends for him, and he's scared. He thinks he's going to get killed, and he brings him in, and what does David do? He says, you're going to eat at my table. Man, everything that I have is yours. Why? Because you are now the benefactor of the covenant that I made. You didn't make the agreement, but now you get the blessings of it. Let me bring this home because you guys are staring at me. Let me bring this home for a second. God had already decided what he was going to do in Christ Jesus down here. God already knew that we were going to be in a fallen state, a sinful state, and that we couldn't get out. But God had made an agreement. God had made a covenant. Eternal in the heavens. The blood of an everlasting covenant. And therefore, God the Father and God the Holy Spirit saw fit that the Son should come to the earth, be robed in flesh, that he should suffer and die that he should receive the wrath of God upon himself for the sins of all mankind, past, present, and future. And you and I, even though we never did anything, even though we were not able to save ourselves, even though we couldn't earn it, even though we couldn't obtain it, now we can receive the blessing because we are now the covenant benefactor. And we enter into that covenant agreement by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ when we give him all of our heart and when we give him all of our life. And now the blessings of God are available to you and I because God made the agreement and God keeps the terms of the covenant. Are you listening tonight? Our part to play in that is faith. Our part to play in that is obedience. But let's take a look at this for a second. Hebrews chapter number 9. Let's go New Testament. Hebrews chapter number 9. We were there for the past two weeks. Hebrews chapter number 9. And in Hebrews chapter number 9, we're going to take a look at a couple verses. Hebrews chapter 9, starting in verse number 15, reading through verse number 17. This is why Jesus had to die for you and I. This is how we were bound to the Lord. Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 15, for this reason, he is the mediator. Speaking of Jesus, he is, capital H, the mediator, capital M. What is a mediator? Mediator, you oftentimes think of mediation. You think of two parties that that are having a disagreement, that are having a scuffle, right? There's a legal battle going on. And they go to see a mediator. mediator. This is a go-between. This is somebody who can be in between these two parties and who can bring them to terms, can bring them to an agreement. Jesus Christ saw that we were at war with God, that we had rebelled against God and that there was no resolution to this argument. 
And that the wrath of God was being stored out and was going to be poured out on all of those who are disobedient. And so what did Jesus Christ do? He became the mediator. He was the go-between. He was the bridge between the two parties. Now representing man to God and God to man. Are you listening tonight? Hebrews chapter number 9 verse 15. For this reason he is the mediator of the new covenant. The new agreement. How? By means of his death. For the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, speaking of the law of Moses, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal, what's that word up there? I only heard about five or six of you guys. What's that word up there? Let's try it all together. What is that word up there? Inheritance. Inheritance. Didn't I have you shout that from Abram? Lord, how will I know that I will inherit it? And God says, no, assuredly. Why? Because I've passed through the pieces. Because I've cut covenant. Because blood was shed. You can know assuredly that you will receive that inheritance. Now, Jesus Christ, by means of his death, what happens? For the redemption of the transgression under the first covenant, we were lawbreakers. We had messed up. But God came with his blood. He purchased us. He redeemed us. He bought us out of that slavery. That those who are called may receive the promise of of the eternal inheritance. In other words, you can know that you are on your way headed to heaven when you have received Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. (laughs) Verse number 16, for where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. What on earth is he talking about? A testament. We know about the Old Testament and the New Testament. Testament is another word for covenant. So, Where there is a covenant, there must also be of necessity the death of the testator or the one who is making the agreement. Look at the next verse. 17, for a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. In other words, you've heard of the legal document, the binding document, the agreement called a last will and testament, right? So God had a plan of eternal salvation. And God had this plan before the foundation of the world. And all throughout time, all throughout our existence here on the planet, that testament, even though it was the will of God, couldn't be made of effect until Jesus Christ died. And after he died, that will, that original will, that original plan of God was now brought into effect. Why? Because Jesus Christ died. The testator had died. And now his last will and testament, so to speak, was that you and I could be brought into a relationship with him. Now, it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop there. Okay? Because Jesus isn't dead anymore. Now he has been raised from the dead. What does that mean? Turn with me to the book of Romans. Romans chapter number 7. Everybody doing okay? Romans chapter number 7. And in Romans chapter number 7, we're going to take a look at a couple verses, verses 2 through 4. Romans chapter 7, verse number 2 through verse number 4. It's talking about a husband and wife relationship. And it says in Romans chapter 7, verse number 2, For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. Now, we understand that. You're no longer married. Why? Because the dude's dead. Verse number three. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress though she has married another man. So if a lady's husband died, she's free to marry whoever she wants to. Why? Because she's no longer bound by that law any longer. Now she can go and marry whoever, right? Because now she's not an adulteress. No, she's a widow. He's dead. He's not coming back. But look at this. Look at this. Verse number four. Therefore, my brethren. In other words, therefore is therefore a reason. In other words, because of what I just said about a woman who was married to a man, that man died. Look at this. Therefore. My brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ. In other words, when Jesus Christ died, and you and I look to that cross by faith, the Bible tells us that we have 
been crucified with Christ, that now we are in Christ, Christ is in us, and that when we look to that cross by faith, that now we are in Christ Jesus, and that the wrath of God was poured out on Christ Jesus, and in essence, our sins were taken care of at the cross. So you and I died in Christ at the cross by faith. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ that you may be married to another. Now we're no longer married to that Old Testament law. We're no longer bound by those sins. But now we can be married to another, to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. Wow. That means that because Jesus Christ died, we died with him, that now we are dead to the law. We're no longer married to that. But because Jesus Christ was raised again, now he is the husband and we are the bride of Christ here on the earth. And we're no longer married to that law. No, now we can go and be married to Jesus Christ. Amen. Some of you guys are getting a hold of this. So now we're married to Jesus Christ. That means we're bound to Jesus Christ. We are blood bound to Jesus Christ. A couple of things tonight, quick things that I want to take a look at. What we're bound to. We are bound to a couple of things in Christ Jesus. We are bound to. Number one, we are bound to be loyal unto death. The fact that we've married Jesus Christ means that we are to be loyal to Jesus Christ unto death. In the book of Hebrews, it it, it says, you've not yet shed your blood and you're struggling against sin. In other words, he's, he's saying, You haven't done everything. You haven't been so loyal unto death. And and, and don't fret when God starts to chasten you and correct you. Sometimes we do something bad, we mess up, and all of a sudden God starts to discipline us, and we say, well, that's just it. We throw up our hands, and we decide, no, I'm going to walk away. I can't do this Christianity thing. I can't be holy enough. Everybody else in that church is probably holy. I know the pastor's probably holy. My goodness, I'm just full of holes. I, I just keep messing up. I can't do it. But the Bible says when you come into the family of God, when you say yes to Jesus, now you're married to Jesus, and therefore you are in covenant with him. And you are to be loyal unto death. You know, when I was talking about my covenant partner over here, Pastor Luke, and I was saying that, that we pass through the bloody pieces. If Pastor Luke had some enemies on the other side of the river that crossed the river and started coming against him, all he had to do was say, hey, covenant partner, we're fighting a battle. And I would have to be loyal even if I knew that my loyalty would cost me my life. In the same way, we can't run from the things of God. We can't run from holiness. We can't run from purity even if it hurts. Even if we don't like it. Even if it rubs our flesh the wrong way. Why? Because we like to drink. We like to smoke. We like to have sex. We like to do all those things. And yet God is saying, I want you to put those things aside. You died to that stuff, and now you're married to me, and I'm a jealous God. And therefore, I don't want you sleeping around. I don't want you going around. I don't want you doing all that stuff, snorting that stuff up your nose, smoking that stuff, toking that stuff, whatever it is. God says, I want you to put that stuff away. It's useless. You have an eternal inheritance. You have a place in the family of God. You have a calling. You have a purpose. What are you doing messing around with the world? You died to the world, and now you're mine. And so we are to be loyal even unto death. I'll put up Jeremiah chapter 34, verse number 18 in the New Living Translation. I like the way that it expounds on this. God is speaking to the nation of Israel who had been unfaithful. And he says, because you've refused the terms of our covenant... I will cut you apart just as you cut apart the calf when you walked between its halves to solemnize your vows. Oh, my goodness. My, if we in America could get a glimpse of the real fear of the Lord, I don't think that we would see things the way that they are in our nation. I don't think that we would see so much pornography. I don't think that we would see so many scandals. I don't think that we would see so much hurt on the street and in the neighborhoods I don't think that we would see a lot of the things we see. Why? Because we are so afraid of offending God. We have a fear of the Lord. Why? Because we, we, we know the terms of the covenant. We are to be loyal, loyal unto death, even if it hurts, even if I don't like it. it listen, I'm in covenant now. I don't have that option anymore. I've got to be loyal unto death. Revelation chapter 12, verse number 11 
Talking about our struggle against Satan, here's our covenant partner. God has called us into battle. Now we are battling. We are there with the Lord. And now God is saying, I want you to fight the good fight of faith, church. And in Revelation chapter 12, verse number 11, we see the saints battling Satan. And look at what it says in Revelation 12, 11. It says, and they overcame him. How? By the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Wow. Wow. That means that in our struggle against sin, it doesn't matter what happens. Kill this body, I don't care. Why? Because I get to go be with Jesus. My goodness, doesn't matter what you do to me here in the flesh, because I know that I've got an internal inheritance waiting me, and I will follow my Jesus even to the grave. So we are bound to, number one, be loyal unto death. Second, we are bound to not fear. Never fear, church. Jesus said, fear not, little flock, for I've given you the kingdom. But we are bound to not fear. Why? Because we're in covenant with Almighty God. Listen, if, if me and Pastor Luke were going into a battle, we, we'd do all right. We would scrap. We may go down punching, but, you know, we, at least we were punching, right? But even though I love Pastor Luke, I'm in covenant with God. And if I'm fighting a battle... That means that I can call on my covenant partner, and my covenant partner will come running to my defense. Oh, I don't think you guys are getting a hold of this yet. Let me, let me bring it even closer to you. Everything that I have when I got married to my wife, Jessica, became hers. Everything that she had became mine. Now, I choose not to use my makeup. I let her use my makeup. I'm just kidding. She chooses not to use my razor. But here's the thing. Everything that I have is hers. Everything that she has is mine. When she goes shopping, she uses her money. Now, she doesn't make a paycheck. You say, well, then how is that her money? Isn't that your money? No. Everything that's mine is hers. So if she has a need, she says, honey, I'm going to buy this with our money, right? But let me tell you something doesn't matter how much money I have here on the earth. If I have a need, then now everything that's mine is God's, but everything that's God's is mine. If I have a need, all I got to do is say, Father, Jesus, I have a need here on the earth. We are bound in covenant, and now, God, I'm asking you to get out our checkbook because we got to go make some purchases. You say, Pastor Dan, how does that work? Because you know what? I I feel funny praying a prayer like that. This is how you pray. You say, Lord, you know what I have need of before I even ask. But God, I'm going to ask anyways. You ask God for that provision, and then you entrust it to him and patiently wait. Work hard at your job. Do what you need to do, and God will bring about the provision. That's how that works. That's how that works. Same thing in your battles. If you're struggling, if you're going through a difficult time, you go and you lean on your covenant partner. That's why the Bible says that we are to enter into the throne room of grace. We are to approach the throne and find mercy and grace to help in a time of need. In other words, it's not your ability that's going to get the jobs done. It's God's ability, your covenant partner. He is the greater one that lives within you. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. And if God be for me, who then can be against me? What can man do to me? See, when you're going through a problem, it's time to approach your covenant partner and say, covenant partner, we've got an issue. Let's take care of this thing together. And you work it out in prayer. I'm going to put up a verse on the overhead for you in Haggai, Old Testament, Haggai chapter 2, verse 5. God is speaking to the children of Israel. He's telling them to be brave. He's telling them to build. He's telling them to move forward. And he says this. He says, according to the word that I covenanted with you. Literally, that he says, when I cut covenant with you, when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. Everybody say, do not fear. See, oftentimes we take a look at the problem instead of our covenant partner. Oftentimes we take a look at the obstacle instead of the one who made the oath. Oftentimes we've got our eyes on issues rather than on the one who included us in this wonderful covenant of grace. There was a man by the name of Henry Stanley. 
You remember Stanley, he, he went and met up with Dr. Livingston and, and said those famous words, Dr. Livingston, I presume. Now, Henry Stanley, in, in his travels, cut covenant 50 times with tribes throughout his travels in Africa. 50 times. And every time that they would cut covenant, they would make a scar on the arm. What they would do is, you, you, have, you remember the old movies with the, the Indians, the blood brothers and all that kind of stuff? They would rub the blood together. Maybe you did that as a kid. You made that little mark, and then you rub the blood together, right? Or you spit in your hand, and then you... No, you didn't do that. Uh, just me, right? Okay. So anyways, they, 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 they were the blood brothers. Well, Henry Stanley, every time that they would cut covenant together, he would make that, that scar on his arm. And then when he would travel in Africa, the tribes were very, very cautious. At the time, there were slave trades. And if people were coming in trying to take land, trying to take people, man, they would attack them. Especially, you know, somebody coming in with a big, long uh, uh, group of people and, and, and lots of weapons and things like that, man, they would ambush them, they would attack them, they would kill them because they didn't want to be enslaved and they didn't want their land taken away from them. And so here's Henry Stanley, he's traveling, and the reason why he was able to travel so much was because he had cut covenant. What he would do is he would travel very light, travel very alone. And so he wasn't seen as a threat, but above and beyond that, when he would come into contact with a new tribe, and they would grab their weapons and start to raise them up against him. All he had to do was raise up his arm and show them that he was in covenant with many other tribes. They didn't know who he was in covenant with. They didn't know who his covenant partner was. And so in their minds, they're thinking, if we kill this guy, who's coming after us? And it wasn't just one. There was 50 other tribes that now were backing this man. Listen, I've got good news for you. You've got one covenant partner that counts, and he is the greatest covenant partner you could ever have. And when you have a problem, you lift your hands to Jesus, and you call on your covenant partner, and he's going to come to your rescue. He's going to come to your aid. He is the helper. He is the Holy Spirit, and he's got your back. We are bound to, number one, be loyal unto death. Number two, we are bound to not fear. And final thing tonight, we are bound to listen and obey. You're, you may still be in Romans. I don't know where you're at. Maybe you're somewhere else. You, listen, just stay there. We'll get there eventually tonight. Hebrews chapter 12. That was a joke. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12 isn't a joke. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 24 and verse number 25 says, we haven't come to the old covenant. We haven't come to Mount Sinai. We haven't come to that. We come to Mount Zion. Now we've come to the real. Now we've come to the tangible. We've come to verse number 24 of Hebrews chapter 12. We've come to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Abel's blood was shed, and it cried out for justice. Jesus' blood is shed, and it cries out for mercy. Verse number 25, see that you do not refuse him who speaks. See, Jesus Christ's blood still speaks today, and it cries out for mercy for all of the saints of God, and it imparts grace to you and I, but it gives us a warning here. See that you do not refuse him who speaks, for if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven. In other words, we are now bound to listen and to obey. When God has you on assignment, man, instantly do what God is asking you to do. Oftentimes when I talk to people and I find out that they're having struggles, man, they say, man, I haven't heard the voice of God in such a long time. I'm struggling. I say, what was the last thing God told you to do? When was the last time you heard the voice of God? And after a moment, they kind of sit there and they wait and they wonder and they go, oh, yeah, God told me to do this. My next question is this. Did you do it? Most of the time they say no. And I say, go do it and then come back and let's talk afterwards. So they leave they go do it. They come back. Pastor, man, it's amazing. I've been hearing God all the time now. Well, hello. You were refusing him who spoke. And therefore, God's not mixing words. When God tells you to do something, do it. The Bible says his commands are not burdensome, that God adds no trouble to it. Listen, God is not out to just put a wet blanket all over your fun. God is not the damper at the party. God's not the downer. God is not the party pooper. No, God is not any of that stuff. God is the greatest adventure you will ever have. But listen, you can't go and be the one storming the gates. You can't be the one living the adventures if you didn't go through basic training. 
And basic training is not fun. And oftentimes we wonder, why am I trudging around? Why am I marching? Why am I doing this? But God is looking for faithfulness in the little things so that he can put you over the bigger things. Therefore, when God speaks, we would do well to listen. That's why church is so important. Why? Because God is speaking. God is touching. God is healing. God is encouraging. God is doing things. Oftentimes, it's in church that you're going to hear the voice of the Lord. Man, many times people come to us at the back door and say, Pastor, hey, man, God spoke this to me. And I'll be thinking, scratching my head and saying, I never said that. Pastor Jim said, all the time it happens. Ministries have been birthed in this place. And they came back later and said, Pastor Jim, man, I can't believe it. You know, God was speaking and, and you said for me to, to start this ministry. And Pastor says, I never started that ministry. But now it's an integral part of our church of reaching out and touching people all over the world. Wow. Why? Because we listened and we obey. Last verse for tonight, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 20. For you were bought at a price precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Point of tonight is that we are bound. We are bound by blood, blood of Jesus Christ. We are now in covenant with God. It's the closest, most solemn and sacred of all contracts. It's a marriage to Jesus Christ. And therefore, since we are bound, we are bound to three areas that we saw tonight. Number one, we're bound to be loyal unto death that this is my Jesus. I'm not running away from him, running away from anything that would offend him. I'm running to Jesus. I'm loyal. Doesn't matter if it hurts. Doesn't matter if it takes my life. I'll be loyal unto death. Second thing, we are bound to not fear. We should never be afraid. We never have to cower in fear and wonder at the plan of God. No, God has good plans for you and I. Finally, we are bound to listen and obey. If you got something from the word of the Lord tonight and from this series, come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hallelujah. I want to talk to you guys before you leave. I want to just make sure that your heart is right with God before you walk out of this place. Because it'd be a tragedy if we had such a great night like we did tonight. We sang together. We laughed together. We heard the word of the Lord together. My goodness, you guys were great. I believe that you got something from the word. But let's not stop there. I want to make sure that your heart is right with God. Because if it's not and you die, you'd end up in hell. The Bible's very clear about hell. Jesus speaks about it. It's in the Old and the New Testament. Hell's a very real place. Sometimes people say, well, I don't believe in hell. Well, that's really convenient, but you know what? Jesus talked about it. And just because you say you don't believe in something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It's like saying, I don't believe in Mack trucks. Go out on the slow lane of the freeway. You'll meet one face-to-face -face eventually. So come on, let's, let's talk for a moment. Just want to take a moment of your time, and then I'll let you go. But I want you to just check yourself out in your heart for a moment. What makes you think you're going to heaven? I don't believe anybody in this room says, I want to go to hell. That'd be foolish. We know that it's a place of torment. We know it's a place no one wants to go. So what makes you think you're going to heaven? Is it because you've been good? Because nowhere in the Bible does it say that you can be good enough to get in heaven. The Bible says that if we're trying to get to heaven just by being good, it's like filthy rags to God. It's going to get thrown out. Not going to make it just by being good. The standard is perfection. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. So you're not going to get to heaven just by being good. I love you enough tonight, respect you, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. Some of you would say, well, I'm going to get to go to heaven because I, I was raised in church. Parents took me to church as a child, raised me in church, hung a cross or St. Christopher around your neck, had you baptized or christened as a child, took you to religious classes, and you're born in America. America's a Christian nation. We're not any other religions. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven, right? Wrong. Again, nowhere in the Bible does it say that you're raised in church. Parents take you to church, call you a Christian. You wear religious jewelry, go to religious classes, be baptized or christened as a child, or if you're born in America, that you get to go to heaven. And I don't see anywhere in the Bible that it says that because you're not some other religion, that by default, God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven and denying hell. It simply does not work that way. Sometimes people say, but, you know, I'm sitting in church tonight, Pastor. Here I am in church right now, and I consider myself to be a Christian. Not only when I was a child, but now here I am right now. That's great, and I'm glad you're here tonight. But show that to me in the Bible, could you, where you sit in church, call yourself a Christian that makes you a Christian? It's not there. Any more than you can go sit in your garage, call yourself a car, and that makes you a car. You're just a person sitting in your garage. Can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. You say, but at my last church I got involved. Carried the pastor's Bible, sang in the choir, made decisions, taught in the kids' classes. I even got a membership card to that church. That's great. Glad you did those things. But could you, could you take a moment and show that to me in the Bible? Because it's not there. Nowhere in the Bible to say church involvement gets you into heaven. Because you help out, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions. People think of you as a leader. You're teaching the kids classes. Doesn't work like that. 
And again, nowhere in the Bible do I see that God is waiting for your membership card when you enter the gates of heaven. You're not going to make it if that's how you think you're going to get there. What makes you think you're going to get to go to heaven? Sometimes people say, but I know God. I know about Jesus. I know about Easter and the resurrection. Celebrate Christmas every year of my life. I could quote scriptures to you, Pastor, Old and New Testament. That's great. I'm glad you can do those things. But could you show that to me in the Bible? If you've read your Bible, you know that the Bible says the demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. The Bible says the devil himself can quote scripture and knows who Jesus is, and yet he's not a Christian. Everybody look up at me for a second. This is not about what you have in your head. This is not about some mental ascent towards God having head knowledge about who Jesus is, and that's what gets you in heaven. But rather, this is about your heart. Tonight, here's the real question. Have you given God all of your heart, and have you given God all of your life? Because if not, I love you enough to tell you the truth, you're not going to make it. Jesus said it like this. He said, you must be born again. Now, I know our society and pop culture has made a mockery out of that statement. They've raked it through the coals. But what does being born again mean? Here's what it means. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it means you've given God all your heart and you've given God all of your life. It's that simple. God is not looking for a half-hearted relationship. Let me prove it to you. In the book of Revelation, the third chapter, Jesus is speaking. He says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. My goodness, that's some some gross words from the mouth of Jesus. But what's he saying? Lukewarm, what does that mean? Well, here's what it means. A little in, a little out. A little up, a little down. A little token prayer every now and then. An occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, look out. Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. I'm going to say one, two, three. When I say three, I'm going to pop my hand on this pulpit just like this. Bang. When you hear the sound of my hand popping together on that pulpit, bang, just like that, that's your opportunity to lift your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor Dan, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, and denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You put it right back down. You say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh Uh-huh, you might be. But get over it. Because think of the trade-off for a moment. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. Jesus said it like this. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, your call, your choice. I've done my job. I've loved you enough to tell you the truth. God's done his job, sent Jesus, beaten, bloody, hung on a cross for you and I, raised again to life so that you and I could live with him. Now it's your turn, your call, your choice. Will you sit there and do nothing when you know you need to get right with God? Or will you simply raise your hand and acknowledge your need for Jesus in your life? Will you give him all of your heart and all of your life? All across this auditorium, if that's you, you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. If you've never done this, never given God all your heart, never given God all your life, I'm speaking to you. If you're sitting there wondering if you should do this, you're not sure about your salvation, come on tonight and make sure of your salvation. Or finally, if you're lukewarm, you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. You can get right with God in this safe and friendly place by simply raising your hand. Back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, if you're watching by television in the foyer, come on, you can get your hand up and then come into the church service right afterwards. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hand on this pulpit. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Just lift them up high. Thank you. There's one. There's two. Thank you. God bless you. There's three. There's four. God bless you guys. Anybody else real quick? There's four wise people already. Anybody else real quick that I didn't already see? There's four wise people. How about back in that fair room? Anybody back there? No one back there? Okay, what about on this side? Anybody in this family room? No? Okay. Don't you just feel number five? Number five, you're sitting there wondering if you should do this. You should do this. Come on, go for it. Just lift your hand up real quick. Wherever you're at, if that's you, you know you need to get right with God. Real quick, don't scratch your head. I'll count it. wonder how you got into heaven. Just kidding. Anybody else real quick, you need to give God all your heart, need to give God all your life. Just pop it up when I'm looking in your direction. Anybody else? Anybody else? Number five, come on. Come on, I can feel you. Where are you at? Just pop it up when I'm looking in your direction. Anybody else? Anybody else? Well, let's give the Lord a hand for four wise people tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah. God is so good to us. All four of you or wherever you're at, number five. Come on. You didn't get away yet. God's calling for you right now. That's you. Number five, that's you. Praise God, man. Good choice right there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
All right, now, all five of you, or if you're number six, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. Here's what I want you to do. Get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend if you need a friend. Whatever you brought with you to church, get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. I want you to get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies tonight, but we can't do that till we get you down here. So let's all stand and welcome them. If you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, you come right now. Just make your way to the front. Come on. You're all I want. Oh, they're coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. You can come too. Come on down right now. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Hallelujah. You can come too. Come on, just make your way to the front right now. If you raise your hand or even if you didn't, it's not too late. Come on, just get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front. All right, all right. Come on down, come on down. They're still coming. Come on, you can come too. We'll wait for you. Anybody else if you need to come? All right, hallelujah. Amen. Amen. There's a whole lot more than five people up here. Praise God. I'm so glad that you guys listened. Listened and obeyed the voice of the Lord. That's what this is about. Now listen, you don't get saved just by raising your hand. You get saved when you give your heart and life to Jesus Christ. Right over here to my right, your left, this is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave's a really cool guy. Nothing weird's going to go on, okay? You've already passed the weirdest part. That's me, okay? Now, Pastor Dave's cool, all right? He's going to do three things. Number one thing he's going to do, he's going to pray with you, a simple prayer to invite Jesus into your heart, okay? You're going to be born again, brand new on the inside. But you know what? You need to know what to do next. So the second thing he's going to do, he's going to give you some free stuff, all right? A couple little booklets that our pastors wrote that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. It's easy reading, okay? Our pastor wrote it so that you could understand it. Simple little reading. You can invest maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes into sitting down reading that, finding out what to do next with your walk with God. Third thing he's going to do, he's going to introduce you to a friend here in the church that we call a spiritual personal trainer. What that is, it's basically a friend in church that will come alongside you for five weeks, teach you five things out of the Bible that'll help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. You heard of a physical trainer who helps you get buff, right? Okay, spiritual personal trainer will help you to do that spiritually, okay? It's a friend in church that will just help you to go on with God. He'll describe how it works. It's free. You need to do it, okay? So if you guys will make a left turn and follow Pastor Dave, let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.